Hey guys, so this is Game Geek 2 here, back from a long hiatus, and uh, this is a short video, it's meant to be a short video explaining the, um, the new EDU 4.0 system I've created for your Revolver Rum Online multiplayer, with goals, which has a goal of eventually being extended to single player usage as well. So without further ado, I'd like to give a brief overview of what I'm trying to do here. this system. The overall goals, and to walk through all the different factions as well. Just at a very, very high level. So the real goal of this system is to make, stick to the purpose of Europa Lava Room originally, which is to balance the game through historical accuracy, and by adhering to that as closely as reasonably possible within the confines of the Burn Total Engine. That said, it also in implementing this new system, I've also sought to apply principles of product and game design I've learned over the eight or so years since I last uh, did extensive editing on the battle system for your Bobber Arm. And in doing so, I've incorporated a lot more, not just incorporated a lot more documentation and explanation as to what each unit is supposed to do, which is an ongoing project I'm going to be working on, editing through the unit descriptions, but also really try to make every single unit feel unique and have an interesting role to play. And you're going to see this hopefully from the expanded descriptions we've all added here. And apologies for the resolution, the original room is not necessarily optimized for the resolution that my screen has to offer, but hopefully it's still more than adequate. So in any case, without further ado, let me get into all the major changes. So at a very high level, and I'm looking here at the Arche Seleucia, because their faction roster is so diverse that I should be able to go through all of them. So there's several categories of major changes from the vanilla Europe of Barbarum system. Uh, the first and probably most important of these is the Missile Accuracy system. So in basic Europe of Barbarum, you didn't really have any different all of the missiles in a given class had the same accuracy. So javelins always had the same javelin accuracy, peel always had the same accuracy, arrows always had the same accuracy, sling bullets, etc. And, well, to a degree, you know, simple enough, but this doesn't quite reflect the skill of individual units at aiming. Um, and so, the way the Rome engine handles accuracy is, there's a statistic called accuracy versus units in the projectile file, and by moderate um, by modding this, you can increase or decrease the standard deviation of the accuracy, so the spread of missiles, um, and how often they'll stray from their intended targets. So there are several different accuracy classes uh, for each unit type. There are four different accuracy classes for foot archers and skirmishers. There are three different ones for slingers, although most slingers only have the basic one, which is a fairly decent accuracy stat. Um, there are three different, uh, four different for skirmisher javelin men, three different for most uh, infantry javelin men um, who are not intended to be skirmishers, and there are three accuracy classes for horse archers as well. Each of the different weapon types has its own separate set of accuracy classes. So you have um, normal javelins, um, which come in a wide variety of types, but they've all been lumped together as javelin. You have pila who have an inherent accuracy advantage because of their ballistics, in addition to having a very high attack. So a volley of Pila will, actually, will be more effective than its attack, uh, attack statistic suggests because of the better accuracy. And the attack statistic for Pila is already very high. You have Solifera, which are like Pila, but made entirely of iron, so they're a bit more powerful um, and also more expensive. Uh, you have slings, you have arrows, and then the arrow accuracy classes for foot archers and horse archers are different. So we can look through all of these pretty easily here. Um, so some of the worst accuracy you'll get is with these very large um, archer units. Um, unit size is something I'll go into later, but with the with a very basic archer unit like the Tonvare Payat Dog here, um, you'll have uh, 25 arrows, and the, no, arrows is not relevant here, although the better your archer is, the more ammunition they will carry, at least for foot archers. With with horse archers, it's a pretty standard um, 
number of arrows, either 40 or 37, depending on the type of bow they have. But for foot archers, you can see here, the Tanvarai Payath Dog, they're a big levy archer unit. They have, um, they come in large numbers and they have low accuracy. So in practice, what this means is you, if you fire them at long range, um, at their full range potential here of 200 meters, they're not going to hit uh, their intended target as often as a, a better archer unit will. They'll get a big spread. You have a lot more stray arrows. But this is not so bad if you're aiming at a, a bunch of relatively densely packed enemies together. Um, what, what it's bad for is really, really targeting a si one single enemy single enemy unit because a lot of your arrows are just going to miss at long range. Um, as you get closer, this spread becomes less meaningful um, because the because the arrow trajectories, um, you know, the arrow doesn't have as uh, far to go to veer off its intended trajectory. So the relative impact of accuracy always decreases as you move your unit closer to the enemy. Uh, similarly, the Kovka Sealer Nainetadzik, uh, these guys, they have, they also have such an, um, they have a very powerful, they are sort of, um, just a variant on this unit. They also have bad accuracy, come in big numbers, but they fire, um, historically, we have Xenophon telling us that these guys fired arrows almost as big as javelins, and so it's reflected in their higher missile attack, but because um, their their arrows are very big, they have poor um, they have much worse range, so they have 50 fewer meters. And in fact, Xenophon tells us that the the Rodians Rodian slingers who we have over here nearly outrange them by two to one. We don't have that exactly reflected in this case, but you can see these Caucasian archers have 150 meters of accuracy versus these Rodian slingers who have 260. You have better archers like the Toksoltai Suriakoi. These guys are professional archer unit. Um, they they will hit much more often. Uh, they just makes them a better archer unit overall in terms of effectiveness, particularly at a long range missile duel. You have some units that are in the middle, like these Greek Toksotai. They come in smaller numbers. Um, they have a middle decent accuracy, as you as opposed to you can see here low accuracy and you can see here good accuracy. There are very select few archer units with elite accuracy. And to show you one example of them, we might, uh, there are only a few of them, but we might show you the uh, Komatai Agrianai. Uh, they have very good accuracy, um, and you can see they have a small bonus to their attack as well for being an elite archer. So they are probably the only units that'll come close to vanilla EB's accuracy at a very long range. Um, and they have a lot of arrows, and they have a very powerful attack. So these guys, you know, pound for pound, they're going to deal more damage. Um, the disadvantage, of course, is they come in small numbers, and they're expensive. Uh, they're a lot more expensive than a crap, uh, the more basic arch unit, like the Komatai Toksotai here. Uh, these guys have decent accuracy, um, but they, they really will not offer you the same uh, attack power as a more elite archer unit but at the same time, they're cheaper. So if you really want to win a long-range missile duel, this accuracy really matters. There's a lot, uh, um, especially the further away you go, the more important your accuracy statistic is. And this applies to all sorts of units. Um, I think in particular, one should note slingers. So slingers, historically, it, it takes a good amount of skill to use a sling effectively. Um, and slings were able to reach very, very long ranges. Even if you modern tests of slings show that a, a decent tr slinger can pretty consistently get to 200 to 250 meters. Uh, we've picked the upper end of this range here. Um, we have 240 meters for most slingers as their range. Um, there are two elite, elite slinger units in the game, uh, the Rodian slingers and the Balearix. They have uh, lead projectiles that are... Um, have extremely good ballistics from testing, and the ancient sources say that these lead projectiles are the ones able to crush armor. So these elite slinger units are the only two that are able to crush armor. A standard slinger, on the other hand, is um, not necessarily able to crush armor, and you can see they don't do as much damage as an archer unit. But uh, even if you just compare the Toksotai and Svenonetai, you're pretty comparable. They cost about the same. The Toksotai have a higher attack, 
they have lower range and less ammunition. Um, this Pendle Netai, they have a lower attack, um, but they will shoot from further, uh, and they have more ammunition, which reflects the fact that they are able to basically just like pick up stones and sling them around on the battlefield. So really, slingers are sort of a complement unit to archers rather than a substitute. But different factions may find it may there are different situations where you'll want to use slingers versus archers. Uh, archers will cause much more damage more quickly. Um, slingers will cause less damage, but they will hit from a further range, and so they will be able to hit the enemy first. Um, and they can also be useful for layering your levels of missile attacks, which is particularly useful when defending against lighter horsemen. So that, that covers accuracy, and I know that was a lot. Um, let's go on to cavalry charges. Um, and I'll use this to highlight uh, one particular thing we've done here while we're on the cavalry subject. All the generals have an eagle now, which means that they inspire their nearby troops. They are already, they're still able to perform their rallying cry, but the presence of the general himself will make it harder for your army to rout. So, the general is an even more valuable unit now, effectively. Um, th this will help prevent mass chain routes from occurring as easily if you use your general effectively. The downside, of course, is if you're parking your general around, he's not in combat, and he's a pretty effective combat unit. Uh, so you want to be careful. It adds a layer level of strategic depth to use of your general. I should go into cavalry charges in general, though. Um, and I suppose cavalry more broadly. So one interesting thing is that um, in vanilla EB, overhand spear cavalry are kind of useless. They have a terrible, they don't have a super great lethality, and so their charges are not very effective because of the way charges work. Even if you have a high charge bonus, if you don't have a high lethality, then you can have a, a high probability of a hit, but there's not a high probability that if you get a hit, um, it'll kill, because that's how lethality works. It's the probability that a successful hit on the enemy will kill them. And the charge bonuses increase your probability of a hit by giving you a bonus to your attack. So you can see there's a lot of variation in charge strength and lethal cavalry lethality now um, to have a very wide range of variation how effective your cavalry charges are. So for example, you have the Prodromoi here. Uh, they have, and you'll notice the, the lances no longer have armor piercing capabilities. They don't really need them. Uh, just because charge bonuses are so high that um, armor piercing is just adding further to the attack value. And it also reduces the ability of um, heavy infantry to really effectively resist uh, lighter horsemen, which is important. So you have Prodromoi here. They have a two-handed lance, um, so this is 0.33 lethality. Um, and the lethality statistic also scales with the, um, the strength of your mount as well. So yeah, the, the Protoromoi, they ride a light horse, um, they're very fast, they are very have very good stamina, but because they're riding a light horse, their charge is not as effective, and this is reflected in the lethality stat here. They do carry their lance in two hands though, which gives them a nice bonus. It, can, it makes them rather comparable in charge effectiveness to this Nonhoforo unit, which only uses its lance in one hand, a slightly better charge attack in statistics. Um, it only uses its lance in one hand, but it's um, it's still getting about the same power as the Prodromoi with a slightly higher bonus. The advantage, of course, with the Longhofora is they have a big shield, so they're well protected, and they have better armor as well. Uh, the Kambo um, Kambojas, you can see, are relatively similar. Uh, the Osparane Madain, these guys... They have a lower lethality, and they have a lower charge bonus, so they won't deal nearly as much damage in a charge, but the overhand spear, you can see, has a better attack value in melee. So the Protoma, you have at C, a 6 attack value of 0.33 lethality. The Osporon and the, the Lance has a, del a significant delay. The Osporon and Madain, they don't have a delay to their attack, um, and the spear has a lower lethality but higher damage higher attack value. So they'll, and because they don't have a delay as well, they'll fight much more effectively in melee with their overhand spears. And they also have an axe as well, which can do a decent amount of damage. You'll notice further that the axe has a lethality of 0.17. Um, this compares to a standard axe, which has a lethality of 0.14. So 
uh, cavalry have an automatic lethality bonus as well as they have automatic attack and lethality bonuses for their melee weapons, reflecting the ability that you're able to strike from above and you have an advantage in combat in that sense. This is in contrast to vanilla EB in which cavalry have a penalty to their attack. This made cavalry, in particular cavalry melee weapons like swords in vanilla EB, much less effective. In contrast, however, these cavalry, they'll be able to fight for some amount of time in melee. It's still a cost-ineffective decision to fight cavalry against infantry most of the time, unless you can get a flanking attack where you have a huge advantage. But still, um, that means these cavalry are more meaningful, and in particular, it means cavalry without lances are much more effective as a support troop for melee battles. A good example of this would be the Hetairoi Aspido Horoi. Um, you can see they have an attack value of 11 with their Kopis, uh, which has a solid lethality stat, they have a good defense, and so because of that, you can uh, compare them with a lot of other similar cavalry units. So if you look, compare them against the Longhofuri here. Uh, the Longhofuri, they have a 10 attack with their Kopis, and they have 23 defense. Uh, they have Tairoi Aspidohoroi, they have 24 defense and 11 attack with their Kopis. So they'll fight more effectively in melee. Um, they're also a javelin unit, so they're able to deal a decent amount of damage. While we're on the subject, we'll notice that cavalry javelins as well, they have a better, um, cavalry javelins have a higher attack than infantry javelins, uh, they have a slightly lower accuracy, but they have a higher attack, which makes them quite powerful. In particular, it makes a, it's designed to help javelin cavalry really be the effective unit they were. Um, javelin armed cavalry were the, the majority of cavalry in uh, most ancient armies. And, you know, cavalry would still close for melee a lot uh, and attack weakened enemies, but they'd be able to launch a vicious attack with their javelins. So, a javelin cavalry unit, you can get them up close to an enemy and they'll be able to skirmish with, with devastating effects with a very high attack. Um, that said, they don't come in as many numbers, obviously, as infantry, so they still probably will deal a bit less overall damage, but the higher attack helps make up for this and makes them a fairly... and they do carry a couple more javelins than infantry as well. So they'll be a quite mobile force, able to strike hard. So even a unit like Hippaconti style, like these guys, um, with their, you'll see their missile attack of 9, they'll have 8 javelins with decent accuracy, so if you park these guys on an enemy's flank and start throwing in them, they're, they're gonna deal a lot of damage. Now, it probably won't deal as much as an infantry javelin volley, um, simply because it's throwing fewer missiles, but it does have a high attack, they have a lot of these javelins, and because they're cavalry, they're able to position themselves better in a mobile way to fight. Um, as noted, there's a lot of variation in uh, charges. You have this, you can look at the Hetairoi, their lance has a higher lethality, uh, so they're really able to break enemies with an attack um, really, really able to just, like, smash them, uh, which, you know, that's what they're supposed to do. Uh, Hetairoi are a very elite cavalry unit, um, they're well armored, they're well disciplined, uh, they're pretty much the highest end of the, uh, cavalry that still have good stamina, and they draw an interesting contrast with cataphracts, which, as you can see, their lethality attack is much higher on the lance. They have a significant delay that balances this out, um, but they have a very high lethality attack on the lance in addition to their charge statistic. You can see, I mean, their charge statistic looks the same, and in fact, the cataphract lance attack is lower because the Hell Knight cataphracts aren't quite as elite of a unit as some of the eastern ones, but at the same time, their lance deals a lot more damage. Uh, their charge is going to deal a lot more damage between the uh, the lethality and the tight formation that cataphracts use, which means that they will deal more damage per unit area and really punch into enemy troops. And this reflects the history of, of the cataphract unit in that it really was um, the only... Cataphract units really were the only ancient cavalry that were consistently mainly used for frontal assaults against weak opponents. Um, some of the, the steppe horsemen did this as well. But among the settled peoples, the cataphracts were, um, the, 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 and some of the um, eastern peoples as well, the cataphracts were really able to uniquely go for frontal assaults like this. So that covers all of those. Um, 
I can talk a little bit about unit sizes in general. I mean, there's more variation in unit sizes. There's not a ton. There's it's still like conceptually roughly the same, but on the whole, units are bigger. Um, for example, you can see not all cavalry are 25 anymore, um, or 50, or I guess in this size, 100. Huge. Um, more basic cavalry units will have 120 troops. Uh, medium uh, veteran cavalry units will have 100 troops, usually. Um, and some of the heavy cavalry as well. And then really elite horsemen are going to have 80 troops. This will all be like, you know, uh, 60, 50, 40 on large size. Same with archers. Archers are not all 80-man, uh, uh, 160-man units now. There's a lot of variation. And the accuracy system lets us balance this. So the Persian archers, there's a lot of them. Uh, they don't have that many arrows. They have 25, which is pretty good. It doesn't quite stack up to a professional unit with 35 arrows, though. But it means they'll be able to do, you know, you just point them at an enemy. They'll be able to pour on a ton of fire quickly, which is how the Persians historically fought. Um, you have, um, which compares, uh, you know, disfavorably to an elite archer union in many ways, in terms of they won't hit nearly as often, but, you know, that's still usable. Um, you have a decent amount of variation in infantry unit sizes as well. A lot of these are roughly the same, but elite infantry on the whole have, um, many of them are up to a full 80, 160 man unit size. And the cost system, it does balance this out. Elite infantry aren't as expensive as they used to be man for man. Um, you also see some of the phalanxes. The phalanxes are no longer all 240 men. In fact, it's only the levy phalanxes that are 240 men. Um, like the Pantodapoi Phalangitai, the Machimoi Phalangitai, and the Phalangitai de Utroi. Um, the standard phalanxes are, um, are 110, uh, 220 men. Um, and this makes them slightly more affordable. It reflects that they aren't quite as numerous, but they're still a bit more numerous than a base, uh, most infantry units, which tend to be about 100 men for a standard uh, profession, uh, semi-professional or professional warrior, uh, 240 for a more levy unit, or and uh, select few militia and some militia units. Um, typically, uh, 180 for slightly rarer units um, among a faction, as opposed to uh, 200. Um, uh, 160 for veteran units and elite units, and some elite units have as few as 120, um, reflecting the fact that they're very rare. But as you can see, elite units, um, elite infantry have really good uh, stats in a fight. You can see these Hippospistae, they have um, very good attack, a very effective charge, and their spear also does a lot of damage. If you look at their spear with 12 damage as compared to the Thure Forte 8, um, that plus the uh, enhanced defensive abilities means these guys will really beat the crap out of the Thure Forte in melee. Um, and because of their high morale, they'll also resist longer, so overall they really, elite infantry certainly can be worth it. Whereas I don't think they really were in Vanilla EP. So that covers a lot of the major changes. Um, one more might be mass. Uh, so you'll see there's... Um, I haven't documented all of this correctly in this alpha, but in general, infantry units have a bigger variation in their mass values. So... So, for example, a standard bar, um, a standard infantry unit, uh, semi-professional, have one mass. Most lighter barbarians and Roman legionaries will have a, a slight bonus to this. Units that fight in a very dense hoplite-like formation will have an extra bonus, to, higher bonus to mass. Um, units that are intended as assault, vicious assault units, like the Geisatai, the Iberian assault infantry, the Petites Extraordinari, etc., these will have uh, an even bigger bonus to mass to make them um, able to break a lot of tougher infantry opponents uh, in terms of formation to push through and create a gap. And a lot of uh, archer units have awful mass um, and slinger units. So they'll get pushed around by almost anybody, uh, especially horsemen, which um, this has an additional effect of um, making them even more prone to route than before. So yeah, this mass variation allow basically allows for units to more effectively push each other based on their mass values. 
um, and this will make infantry battle lines more dynamic. Um, in general, the whole system uh, is a bit more dynamic in terms of how the uh, infantry battles work. On the whole, um, units have higher defenses uh, and lower attacks, especially spear units, which have been given an extra defense boost to comp instead of an attack boost to compensate for the, um, the penalty they get for, uh, to defense against other infantry for having the light spear attribute. I figured I'd use this instead of giving them an attack boost just to make spear units um, not oddly kill each other more quickly than sword units do, which didn't make much sense to me. They'll still do that slightly, but not to the same extent. And um, spears in general make for a very, very effective defense weapon, as well as a solid attack weapon. Although you still want, want you to use spearmen for attacks against infantry to the same extent you want to use swordsmen, they'll still do a decent job. Another point of note is uh, charges. You notice in general, uh, infantry charges are much higher. So for example, even this basic 304 unit will have a 14 charge and 8, um, eight attack but 14 charge. Um, what this means is that the first few seconds of a melee as the troops collide will be the, um, the most vicious, the most effective, most damage will be caused then. Um, and so if a unit can, um, can can weather this, can weather the initial force, which most of the time, two fresh units, if they collide into each other, they'll deal decent damage to each other, but then they'll sink into a long grinding melee. And that's how ancient battles worked, really. There would often be, uh, some scholars think that units would withdraw, charge again against each other, simply because having an extended drawn out melee between large bodies of troops is just very tiring. <laughs> So, the charges, they really are going to be where you get most of your impact. And after you get that initial charge impact, you get a sinking melee. But if you can have a unit charging in, some missiles raining in, and a lot of ways to cause a lot of casualties quickly, this is going to shatter an enemy unit. Because if a unit loses troops quickly, it starts to lose morale fast. And if you have this surrounded by enemies, your friends are dying around you, you're going to break. So a standard, um, so it's more pos. So even if the melees are a bit slower, and they're already pretty slow in vanilla EB, but even if they're a bit slower, um, with the battle, with the more effective infantry charges, it's more possible to rout an enemy upon contact. So, uh, or soon after contact, you just have to do it carefully. In particular, uh, continental Celts. Um, and they have a bonus to charges, so the Celts are going to have some vicious charges, uh, and this reflects the ancient sources stating that the Celts often would, um, even more compared to a lot of barbarians, quote-unquote barbarians, would be, um, have a vicious charge, but they were less effective as the melee war on, um, and perhaps would tire. In the game, obviously, we don't have as much of the ability. We can't tweak stamina that much. There's only a few, three different stamina levels: um, nor, uh, normal, hardy, and very hardy. We can't really do much with that. But we do know that you know the barbarian infantry units. They're just like less armored, and so they won't do as well in an extended melee. So that's a bit around infantry charges. I think I've covered mostly everything that's major about the system change so far. Um, again, you'll notice there's a lot of little documentation here that'll explain like what the unit's lethality is, what the components of their defense are, what their mass is, what their morale is, etc. To give players more insight than just the basic descriptions like good morale, okay, I mean, good compared to what? Like, these guys honestly have pretty crappy morale, it's just good compared to vanilla Rome when morale units were very low. Uh, morale of these units was very low. Um, Instead of, unfortunately, I'm not sure if we can change the threshold on these uh, automatic des descriptors, but we certainly can uh, just add in little blurbs explaining what the um, what the statistics are, and help the players make informed decisions. So that was an awful mouthful. Um, you can see that there's a, a wide range of um, changes compared to vanilla EB, and even some compared to EBO 3.4. Um, I've documented 
you know, I'm still working on making sure the documentation is good. All of these stats have been generated from a spreadsheet, which contains extensive notes on some exceptions I've made, but most of the costs, uh, the attack values, the armor values, etc., are just outputted from the spreadsheet. Um, I will be releasing this w once the alpha is done and we have an official beta version or an EB EDU online EDU 4.0 release. I'll include the spreadsheet as well as all my change documentation um, and uh, comparisons with unit availability that were made, um, uh, changes in unit availability that were made compared to standard EB.